Praise be Jesus and Mary. I am very honored and happy to be back uh, and to um, share with you the mysteries of our, of our faith and also the zeal that uh, Mariette has for the church and for all of us. It's a, a privilege to have such an apostle as Mariette. I know she will be shy if I say these things. <laughs> But someone has to say it. <laughs> so I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit for his word so that we can share this moment in the word of the Lord. And I'm going to read to you from the letter of St. Paul to Titus. Chapter 3 from verse 1 on. Maintain good deeds. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for any honest work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all men. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy hated by men and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of deeds done by us in righteousness, but in virtue of His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit, which He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior so that we might be justified by His grace and become heirs in hope of eternal life. The saying is sure. I desire you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to apply themselves to good deeds. These are excellent and profitable to men, but avoid the stupid controversies genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels over the law, for they are unprofitable and futile. As for a man who is factious, after admonishing him once or twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is perverted and sinful. He is self-condemned. The word of the Lord. Amen. So we all, we all wonder how can we... Um, address our faith to everyone we meet. And we know that it's not always by telling them through words uh, what we mean and the faith we share. Uh, the most important testimony we share is our conduct, who we are, the way we are. Like St. Francis of Assisi used to tell his friars, go and if necessary, use the words. So it's about what we carry. St. Paul tells us <clears throat> that we are vessels of clay that carry the treasure. And we couldn't have a better image of ourselves than that, <clears throat> because this is who we are. What could be more fragile than a vessel of clay? And that's who we are. We break so easily, we are so vulnerable, but we do carry the treasure. We carry the Holy Spirit. And it is amazing how the Spirit knows <clears throat> that we are so weak. You know, it's like uh, God was telling St. Paul when he was asking about being delivered from that thorn in the flesh. And God told him, my grace suffices you. I glorify myself in your weakness. And uh, this is so important to have present. But at the same time, we have to understand that we live in a world that is totally given into materialism, consumism, relativism, and all of the isms that lead you to the abysm, because that's what it is. That's the world we live in. So more than ever, we need to be per people of God that has the integrity of the truth at all times, that we will not fall into human respect, and that we will always be with the fear of God. And this is the most important part, because we need to be these beacons of light, definitely. This is our calling. And uh, 
it's, it is a great challenge because we have to rise above our humanness, rise above the lower self and embrace the higher self of the spirit which has been given to us by God in order to be strong and brave and daring. Uh, when people speak about St. Peter, sometimes some of the passages before Pentecost, St. Peter appeared to be kind of weak. But if you really look at him closely, you notice how brave he was. He didn't have the Holy Spirit and he dared to walk on the water. He was not ready to die for his master, but he made it all the way inside that priest's house when they arrested him. He was inside the house. He walked inside the enemy. He didn't have, at that moment, the Spirit of God to be able to die for Jesus. And that's why he denied him three times. But you notice the big change after Pentecost. Once they got the Spirit, they went head on into the gospel, into the people to listen to the gospel, to testify the truth, and they were no longer afraid. So, and this is us today. We are the people of Pentecost. We are the people of the Holy Spirit. We are the ones that have been anointed by the Spirit that came to uh, the, this room of, of the upper room where Pentecost took place. And we are the children of that room. We are inheritors of that fire, of that, those tongues of fire. And uh, we need to believe this because we do have it in us. But you see, the more you let yourself be sunk in the flesh and the material self, the less you have contact with the, with the gifts. And so that's why we need to live a prayerful life. We need to live a sacramental life of often confessions and often Eucharist and uh, good deeds and a good heart that is focused on goodness. I always say you need to be good. We need to be good to be of God. This is the bottom line. We don't have to look in many places to find out how to sanctify ourselves. To be good is to be holy. And, and this is what it takes for the Holy Spirit to work through us, to do what the Holy Spirit needs to do today through us. It's like you have children and the children are out in the world. They have to go to school. They have to face the world one way or the other. And you cannot walk with them every step of the way. All you can do is to make sure that they live within the light when they are with you. They are in the kingdom of God. Then once they venture out of the light where they live and go into the world, they may bring the light with them if they are striving for goodness in their lives. And some, you know, each one of us has to go through the mud. I tell people, if you show up at the tribunal of Jesus with your boots clean, they send you back, right? <laughs> they send you back because we all have to walk through the mud. And uh, we all have to learn from that mud. And because it's muddy, the, 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 you know, this territory is muddy. It's, it's, it's a territory of darkness and trials. And, uh, and you see, when you read the passage like the one I told you last night, I think about Peter, when Jesus told him that Satan asked the Father for permission to put him through the grinder. Then we understand we are in the territory's enemy. And Satan is asking God, may I put him through the grinder to see if he really has faith? If he really belongs to you, may I? And God will tell Satan, go for it, go ahead. And this is horrible for us. Why did you do that, God? Well, I need to mold you. I need to straighten you. I need to make you firm. And this is how we do it. Satan shape you up, right? So it's incomprehensible for us, but it is a reality because we have to learn this lesson. You know, when Jesus was tempted in the desert, he wasn't tempted because he needed to be tempted. He was tempted because he was laying out the path, the school for salvation for all of us. So each one of the temptations was a teaching. I tell people, you want to learn about demonology? 
the, the, the three temptations of the desert are the greatest treaty of demonology ever. If you look at them closely, you learn the perfect demonology because Jesus is the perfect teacher and he shows us the enemy. He shows us what the enemy wants and what he is able to do. So one of the things he's able to do and he showed Jesus for us to learn is taking Jesus up the mountain and showing him all the kingdoms of this world and saying, all of this has been given to me. If you kneel and worship me, I give them to you. You see, you, we hear that uh, Masons consecrate themselves to Satan to get power, right? Material power, physical health, and many other things. And you wonder, is that true? Is that possible? And the answer is yes, but not only Masons, any person that enters into a satanic relationship uh, sells their souls to Satan for powers. And look, it's not a joke. It's not something that we made up. It's something that Jesus himself revealed to us. Satan offered that to Jesus. He said, if you worship me, I give them to you, these powers of the earth. So it's a reality. If you enter into this Satanism, you enter into treaties with the devil. See, one of the greatest treaties of the, with the devil is blood, innocent blood. And that's why politicians, bankers, all these people that deal with the greatest powers on earth, they offer Satan the greatest offering, and it's innocent blood. And that is why abortion is the biggest offering to Satan. And then you see politicians and all these people working to approve abortion because when they make it to pass those laws, they receive from Satan lots of power because all that blood is in their credit, is in their books. And, uh, and so is every move people make on the right or the left, on goodness or evil. And uh, we leave this economy. We are in the midst of this economy. And each one of us is dealing with good and evil in every step we take. And we know. And it takes courage to be strong enough to be chasing away everything that is evil from us, from our heart, from our feelings, from everything we are, from our thoughts, from our intentions and tendencies. And we have to constantly be working these forces and placing them where they belong. And it's an art, and it's a science. And Christianly speaking, it's called the science of the cross, because this is the science we deal with. Like St. Paul says, we, uh, we look for a crucified Jesus, which means we look to die on the cross with the Lord in every step we take. We are crucified with Jesus if we obey him during this earthly life, because there is no other way to heaven than climbing through the cross. And you see, when Jesus told us that he was going to go to prepare us a place, he, uh, he ascended, ascended, and went back to where he came from. And when he did that, he located us. I tell people, Jesus is our GPS because he gave us a perfect location. He said, you are down and you need to come up. But he left us the ladder to climb the cross. We have to climb the cross in order to make it where he is. And then it's called mystically the Mount of Zion, right? Where all the tribes of God climb to the holy city of Jerusalem. And this is, this is something we have to have very clear in our hearts that our life should be ascending. You know, when people live in sin and is, uh, lives uh, according to this materialistic world, then you are not in an ascending mode, you are descending, because you are not growing into the light, you are growing into the darkness, therefore you are sinking. And there are only two directions we can take. One is to ascend, which is, uh, embracing the Spirit, embracing the grace of God, embracing the obedience to God, embracing the blessings of the church, embracing 
Jesus' invitation to make it home. And this takes a battle. That's why St. Paul describes this like going to the stadium to participate in the Olympics and to, uh, to run as a good athlete of serving perfect continents, not like one that is going to win a perishable crown, but one that is going to win an eternal crown. Imagine natural athletes, they have to train so heavily. And you know how demanding it is to make it in the Olympics. It's so demanding. So think about the Olympics of God. They are even more demanding. We, we don't train eight hours a day for the Olympics of God. We train 24 hours a day. That's how demanding it is to be an athlete of God and to make it into the unperishable crown at the end of this life. Is to give yourself to God truly, to sacrifice all your tendencies, want and desire of this material world, and focus on God for real. And obviously, this takes serious steps. It takes a quantum leap, because it begins with a fiat, with a decision you have to take to be good and holy. And that takes a moment, a gigantic moment. I ask many Catholics uh, if they ever went on their knees and begged God to give them the strength to decide to be holy and to sanctify themselves in this life. And you'll be surprised how few do that. Most people are kind of afraid of doing that or don't have the strength to do that or don't feel like they have to do that. And it's because they are so attached to this material world and to this flesh that the spirit is not able to lift them into this grace where we know we have to be holy, we have to give the fiat to God to be his. But we know that God wants 100%, like we were talking last night, those that were here. God wants 100%. And uh, we need to understand that. Most of us have been in school. And you know, when you are in school, a good student is, is he that gives it all, 100%, and is the one that makes the grace, the highest grace. But if you go halfway, if you go a great percentage, but not 100%, you're not the best. And Jesus wants 100%. That's why... I always give the example I probably gave you last night of Peter walking on the water. See, when Peter asked Jesus, if it is you, Lord, give me the grace to walk on the water towards you. And he gave him the grace. And, and Peter dared to walk on the water. But he sank before he made it to Jesus. And Jesus rescued him. But Jesus didn't applaud him. Jesus told him, man of little faith. And you will expect Jesus to congratulate him for all the steps he took. But that is the way of the world. That is a human way. Oh, great. You made such an effort. Keep on trying. No, that is not the language of Jesus. Jesus wanted 100% from Peter. And Peter didn't give him 100%. And Jesus was not happy. And this is what is going to happen to us once we make it to Jesus. He's not going to say, I know you try. Thank you for giving me 70%. That was great. Uh, no. He's going to call you for what you didn't give him. And that's why we have purgatory. See? Because he needs you to fulfill the 100%. And uh, we have to know that this is the time to give the 100% now before we go. And uh, we don't know when God is going to call us. And you know very well that death do not choose us by age. Death comes unexpectedly. And we, the next thing we know, we are before Jesus, right before him. And there is no returning. There is no way to mend anything anymore. You are in the justice of God, and there is no going back. So you have to face what you became. And so today, we have to be very sincere and brave to face ourselves in the mirror of our conscience 
and dare to see who we are. You know, if you dare to go in front of the mirror of your conscience, be sure that the Holy Spirit is going to show you who you are, what you're up to, what you have done, what you try to do. All of that will be clear. It is like people talk about ilu illumination of conscience. And I know that illumination of conscience is an amazing uh, gift. At the same time, I know that to have a true illumination of conscience, you need to be in an ecstasy. Because if you're not, you die. See, the fullness of conscience about sin is a killer. You know, we are not able to, hold, to, to face it naturally. I give you an example of the spiritual realm and the material realm. Our Lady, the Virgin Mary, was visited by the Archangel San Gabriel in the Annunciation. And it wasn't a dream. The Archangel came personally, directly to Our Lady. And uh, because she is pure, so she was able to face the light face to face, eye to eye. She's pure. But St. Joseph got it in a dream, you see, which is the equivalent of being an ecstasy. It's not a natural state. A dream is not a natural state. And so because he couldn't get the angel directly to him. Some people say, how come Abraham got these three men that's supposed to be the Trinity or whatever, whoever they were? But no one knows that Abraham was in a trance. He was in an ecstasy. Remember how he was acting? Stay, I'm going to cook, uh, I'm going to kill, I'm going to do. He was like all taken like St. Peter was in the mountain when the transfiguration of the Lord. He was all in a trance saying... Well, should we build three, three little houses, or however you call them? And uh, she, you see, he was not in a natural state. He was in an ecstasy. And this is the way we deal with the light, in ecstasy. We cannot face it naturally. And therefore, our conscience, the plentifulness of our conscience, we cannot face naturally, because it will kill us when we go into the true sense of sin. The true sense of sin is so severe, is so grave, is so incredibly difficult that we cannot handle it naturally. We can naturally commit a terrible sin, but we cannot naturally face it with the conscience. And this is what appears as a terrible contradiction. How come we can sin so easily, but we cannot be conscious easily about what we did? And this is what accumulates an economy against us because we easily sin, but we are not easily mending what we, what we did. We are not easily repairing to the point that many Catholics go to confession and once they get the absolution, they think it's over, deal is over, I'm fine, I'm at peace with God and thank you God, praise God. Thank you for the gift of the sacrament of confession. They forget that absolution is the beginning of reparation, the beginning of amendment, the beginning of walking in a new life, in a life of God, in a life of faithfulness to God. So it's the beginning. See, it's being born again into the grace. And so we have to be so careful about what we do with the sacraments and the mercy of God, the compassion of God, that we have to be constantly repairing the sins we committed that have been forgiven by the church. Our life should be a life of reparation, always. As a matter of fact, we are Eucharistic instruments of reparation. So the Eucharist is our biggest source of reparation. That's why the church teaches us that we need to prepare so well for communion. St. Paul goes as far as saying, don't dare to come before the altar of the Lord to eat of this bread if you are not prepared because you eat your own condemnation. Couldn't be more clear, right? The significance, the transcendence of communion. And why? Because communion is salvation of souls. Jesus rescues the soul every time we take communion.
because we are these vessels of reparation. And imagine when we are adoring the Blessed Sacrament, uh, Jesus is rescuing souls and, and stopping the works of Satan in the territory that covers that particular adoration. Uh, you can take it back to uh, Gethsemane. When Jesus s chose James, John, and Peter to give him company in Gethsemane, he was asking them not to fall asleep. And you will ask yourself, Jesus is God. And the apostles were not right beside him. They were at a short distance. And you wonder, why did he want them uh, awake and giving him company? What kind of company was that? It was a mystical company. It was not a physical company, because if he would have been physical, he would have had them right next to him. But they were a distance away. So they were a mystical company, but he wanted that mystical company to be awake. And this is us before the Blessed Sacrament in adoration. We are James, John, and Peter. And Jesus don't want us to be asleep. He wants us to be vigilant. Why? Because while we are in adoration, Jesus is stopping lots of work of the devil. And we are used as instruments in order to repair and save souls in the flesh, people that are still in the flesh. So for us to be protected in the flesh, God uses the flesh for that protection. That's why we have the priest. That's why we have prayer and intercession. That's why we have the Eucharist as a means of reparation and rescuing of souls. It is, is, it is needed. That's why Jesus took flesh. Because we know God could have done the redemption without taking a flesh. God is capable of everything. There's nothing impossible for God. But look how curious God's ways are. Sometimes he heals a blind man, but before healing it, he pick mud from the ground, spit on it, place it on his eyes, and those things that are absurd. He didn't need to do that. In other times, he healed a blind person without even touching the person. But you notice this little pedagogy, this little activity of Jesus with the material things and the material world, how he deals with it. And then he will send one to bathe in a pool. See, and, and this is the way he works with us. One time... I had a heart attack in Dublin, like uh, year 2004. And uh, before my heart attack, I was in Poland, in, in Krakow, in a, Eucharist, in a Divine Mercy Congress, and I got really sick there. And uh, John Paul II had sent a, a medical, a cardiological bus to Poland to help the poor. And that bus happened to be outside the, the basilic there. So a nun from St. Faustina's community, I was next to be a speaker in that conference, and this nun came to me and said, you look pale, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not okay, <laughs> I don't feel good. And she said, come with me. And she took me out to the bus that was outside, and there was this black cardiologist, huge man, African, and he laid me down there and put all kinds of... Uh, a technology on me, and then he said, you are not well of your heart. You, As soon as you come out of here, you have to go to the hospital. I'm going to give you this and that. So he brought me back. I came back and gave my talk. And since I was feeling good, I forgot. So, and I continued my mission for a few weeks. I ended up in Dublin, and I ended up in emergency room. And I happened to end up in a cardiological hospital, St. James Hospital in Dublin. And he was specialized in cardiology. So the, to make the story short, <clears throat> when uh, I was intervened, uh, the Lord showed me how my time was up. <clears throat> because of my past life, I abused myself so badly that I had no more life. See? And Satan was picking me up, really not to take me to hell, but picking up my temporary life because I abused it. I overused it, and the time was up. But because of the four years of missions that I had already, 
the Lord showed me how he built some kind of a bridge between this moment of dying and the new life I had. And then he gave me the opportunity to bounce back. And he gave me an extra time of life. And the devil left. And uh, it lasted 10 years more, no, 13 years more. Uh, year 2017, again, heart attack, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, this time they had to open me, open my heart, open heart surgery. Same thing. Another bridge was built. And I'm on a bridge right now as you see me. <laughs> I'm walking. <laughs> I'm on a bridge of mercy. <laughs> and I'm saying all of this because we understand the walk of life and how we are picking up the pieces of our life according to our deeds, according to what we do with this life. But God is perfectly walking with us. And, and it's amazing God's justice, how it manifests, and how He wants us to give Him 100%, but He also knows our hearts. He knows the intentions of our hearts. People say, oh, she is of such a good heart. And yes, we agree when we see someone behaving good. We say, oh, it's good. But no one knows the heart. Only God knows the heart. To know that you are good, only God can do it. See, I will never know if you really are good unless God is the one that takes that, that judgment. Because no one knows the heart of anybody. See, one can see faces, but one cannot see hearts. And that's why we have to be so wise in our discernment of spirits. Because we can be fooled very easily. Or we can fool others very easily. So the best way is to be small, to be simple, to be humble. And that way we are protected by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and we are also protected of ourselves because the biggest enemy of salvation is us. We are the biggest enemy of our salvation because we have the power to say yes to the devil, but we also have the power to say yes to God. And so it's up to us. It's up to us. The devil doesn't have the power to destroy us. Only if you give it to him through sin. So that's how much of a grace we have in our lives. That God has given us the opportunity to decide our destiny. And this is important to have clear. Because a lot of people think and blame the devil for everything wrong that happens to them. And how easy is to do that? Always to find someone to blame. But the devil is an instrument. You know, he will act according to what you do. That's the only way. Sometimes he asks for permission to, to put you through the grinder like he did with St. Peter. But when God allows Satan to put you through the grinder, he also gives you the grace to defend yourself and to be strong to go through the trial that Satan brings you. Because God will never lay a weight on you that you're not able to handle. See, he is justice. He is good. He is perfect. So Satan can try, but he cannot break you. You have to understand that if you are faithful to God, you will never be broken by the darkness. But you have to remember, we are in the enemy's territory. And you take a decision of being of God, and every so many hundred Miles of you walking on this earth faithful to God, there is a toll plaza. Boom. And then they ask you, where are you going? Say, I'm going to heaven. Oh, really? Boom. <laughs> Trial. <laughs> and you better have the money to pay the toll plaza. You see? <laughs> and you know that money is a spiritual money. It is your deeds. It is your strength, your faith, your courageousness. That is the money that you carry. And Satan wants to know how much you have. See, that's why he stopped you. Because this is his territory. And then he looks at you going very happily to heaven. Say, oh yeah, but you're still here. You're still mine. Let's see if you really belong up there. What are you doing? Where are you going? And this happens to us all the time. You know, we are always tested with this. I always tell people, if you wake up in the morning feeling weary and doubtful and, and weak, remember, 
you have a visitor, right? So you have to exercise that visitor before you take the first step. Don't walk out of your bed carrying the load of weariness and worries and doubts or anger or whatever it is. Just exercise it until you are clean, until your heart is light, until you are in the love of God, and then you walk out. But don't walk with those feelings, don't walk with those fears, don't walk with this load, because that doesn't come from God. We are free. We are set free by God, regardless of what is taking place. I was in a, in a place a few weeks ago here in, in England, uh, and they have a, an arm, a, the bone of an arm of St. Lawrence. You remember St. Lawrence was put in a, in a grill, and when he was done on one side, he screamed, I'm done on this side. <laughs> and this is one of the most extraordinary testimonies of a martyr, right? But it shows you that even through the pain, even through the trials, we have to keep our strength and our hope and our joy and our peace, regardless of what they're doing to us. And regardless of what life is, is bringing to our lives, we have to be strong and joyful and hopeful and peaceful. And this is a science. It's not easy to handle, but we have to make it there before we go. Because this has to be done here. If we don't do it here, we have to learn in, in the other life. That's what purgatory is called. Uh, because this is a school. I'm sure you noticed that already, that earthly life is a school of souls. We are all in class, permanently in class. I always give this testimony because it applies to this moment, and it's about my mother. One time I was sitting below a big tree, and uh, all of a sudden I saw a big table, a rectangular table up in the air wooden table. So I was in awe looking at the table and then I saw benches around the table. And then I saw people sitting on the benches of that table. And then I saw a, a person floating up in the air that looked like a nun but wasn't a nun for sure, it was like an angel. And that was the teacher, was teaching those that were on the table. And then from that table my mother waved at me like this. She had died years before. But she taught me that she was in class. And she taught me that purgatory continues to be a school. But a school that fulfills what you were not resolving of this earthly life, right? So we are in class now. But we may continue in class later if we don't make the grade here. And the grade, in, to make the grade here is the grade of the love of God. That's the great. See, we are all learning the same lesson. You got married, you are going to be purified through your marriage, by loving and forgiving in your marriage. You are a priest, you're going to be purifying your priesthood with everything you do with the souls God entrusts to you. You are just a missionary layman like me, I'm going to be purified with everything I do everywhere I go around the world in the church. And this is my purification, souls. And this is the way we learn the lesson, our lesson on earth. But we have to be so good students, so attentive, so focused. Because if we don't, we have to do this in a state where we don't have the material instruments and tools to make these lessons effective enough. And uh, it's going to take a long time from the spiritual realm to be mending things that were supposed to be taking place in the material world. So it's not easy to amend, to purify, to purgate a, a state of the natural life in a supernatural state. It's like not easy. I know you probably, it's not easy to grasp this, what I'm saying. But I know the Holy Spirit always shows us inwardly, inside us, what we are talking about when we speak about the Spirit. And when we speak in a spiritual language. The, the gift is that we understand everything. 
not necessarily with our reason, with our intellect, but we understand it spiritually. And the Spirit will explain it to us because it permeates us and it will flow in our daily life by the actions because it's in us and it's a gift. That's what is so great to reflect upon the mysteries of our faith. And when we reflect mystically about who we are, what we are about, what God wants from us, what this world is all about, we enter deeper into the chamber of God, into the chamber of the Spirit, and we become more and more spiritual. We enter more and more into the kingdom of the light, and we become more and more effective for God because God can use us in a greater fashion. God wants to use us. We are the hope. We live in a demonized world, and we are the hope because through us, God can rescue many souls by us becoming who we are to become, who we were created to become, beacons of light. We have to be that. And to be that, we have to trust in the Lord. We have to be strong. We have to be faithful. We have to have this hope and, and, and joy. See, you could never, ever trust a sour Christian, you know, a Christian that looks, that walks around with a lemon face, you know, you know? <laughs> no spirit of God could be in a lemon face, you know, you see, of course we have some lemon times and lemon moments, but, <laughs> but, but don't stay lemon, <laughs> we have to shake it off and make sure Go into the orange, go into the sweet. <laughs> so we need to believe that God is joy, God is peace, God is hope. Those are our theological virtues, you know. There is a reason why faith, hope, and charity are theological virtues, columns of our faith. And we need to be built on those columns. You need to nourish your hope. You need to nourish your faith. And you need to nourish your charity. Nourish it. How do you nourish it? By bringing in this good, this goodness in your life, in everything you do. That is the fuel. That is the nourishment of these theological virtues. And we need to be built on that. Because, you know, uh, religion can betray us and fool us. Uh, sometimes religion makes us feel very comfortable. We become very religious. But religion alone is not going to build those, these theological virtues. You see a lot of people that are so prayerful and so Catholic in so many ways, but they are lemons, right? <laughs> and you, you, you know it's a contradiction. You say, this person is always there in charge on her knees and all of these. And why is she so miserable? Why is he so rude and so hard and so cruel? Well, it's because religion alone doesn't make you holy, you know. You have to grow within. The heart has to be good. And then joy is going to transpire in everything you do. Peace, hope, and wisdom. The wisdom of God that flows through your lips. Because the Holy Spirit is going to flow through you. It's going to just go and embrace everyone. Sometimes with very simple words. Sometimes with no words. But the Holy Spirit is present <clears throat> and is using you. I'm going to uh, end with a reading. <clears throat> and I read to you from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Chapter 5 from verse 12 on. Final exhortations, greetings and benediction. But we beg you, brethren, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we exhort you, brethren, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that none of you repays evil for evil but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, 
Do not despise prophesying, but test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord that this letter be read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The word of the Lord. So I praise God for this moment of reflection. And I praise God because he gave us this moment also to go deeper into his kingdom of light. Amen. 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 <clears throat>